Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Shrieks in the West Room at Flesbury. Lord Halifax copied the following story from a manuscript written by the sister of John Carnson, the child concern who died on April 22, 1835, aged 11. He added the information that the house where the events of this narrative occurred is Flesbury, a lonely country house on the north coast of Cornwall. The family who reside there are the only descendants of the Carnsons of Carnson in Cornwall. The names are given as they appear in the ghost boot, but Carnson should probably be Carnes New, the name of an old Cornish family, and Flasbury should probably be Flexbury near Boot. A plain statement of the facts as they occurred without any attempt to embellish or magnify them will be given. Early in 1835, my brother John was taken seriously ill, and for many weeks his life hung in the balance. A crisis was reached and passed, followed by a fortnight of mingled hope and despair. At the end of that time, his condition showed so great an improvement that the most sanguine hopes for his recovery were entertained by all the family except his mother and aunt, who continued to be very anxious so long as the doctors were unwilling to give a decidedly favorable opinion. It was between five and six o'clock on a fine spring evening towards the end of March. The sinking sun was cheerfully lighting up the west room where three of John's sisters and his brother William were sitting having just left her father in the dining room. Then mother and aunt had returned to John's room. The west room adjoins the principal staircase, which leads up from the entrance hall through the center of the house. There is a small landing at the door of the west room, the stairs ascending a little further to the principal landing. A second flight leads to the upper landing on which opened the room occupied by John. Owing to the center of the house being open, any sound in the hall is distinctly audible on the upper floors. The offices are reached by a long passage behind the hall and the dining room so that ordinary sounds from the hall or the staircase cannot be heard there. The children in the West Room were all in the highest spirits. They were no longer feeling anxious about their brother and were even a little inclined to think that the elders had been unnecessarily alarmed. Poor dear Johnny, they told each other, after all the fuss that had been made, was getting well. To be sure, it was impossible to spoil him. He was such a dear good boy and never made a fuss about himself. But even now Mama and Aunt would not believe that he was not going to die. In fact, that very day at dinner, Mama had been actually crying again. The children went on to discuss the two doctors who were attending John. The younger of the two had particularly annoyed them that day and reporting on the state of the patient to their father. While admitting an increase in strength and appetite he had added, Still, I see no improvement. Papa said he was ridiculously inconsistent. One of the children remarked, and someone went on to say something which raised a general laugh. The laughter had not ceased when a piercing shriek rang through the room. It was as if uttered by someone standing on the landing just outside the open door. There was silence, and then a second shriek, like the first, Another silence and then a third shriek, even louder, more prolonged than the others, and ending in a rattling, gurgling sound as though someone were dying. The children in the room were struck with horror. None of them is likely to forget that awful sound. As I write, it seems to ring in my ears. In a moment, the door of the drawing room on the further side of the hall was thrown open, and Mr. Carnson, who had been sitting in the room alone, hurried across the hall to the foot of the staircase. He called in an agitated voice to his daughter, whom he knew to be in the West Room. Gertrude, what is the matter? Who is screaming in that dreadful manner? Papa, we answered, we don't know. It wasn't one of us, though it seemed quite close. It sounded as though someone were in great distress. Our father said, go down to Grace and ask her if the people in the kitchen are all right. 
although the noise did not seem to come from there. Gertrude went at once and found the housekeeper alone in the big front room. She was standing as if listening and declared she had distinctly heard three shrieks. She was wondering what could be the matter, and though positive that the sound had come from further off than the kitchen, she went there to inquire if the servants knew anything. When she returned, her usually florid face was quite pale. Oh, Miss Gertrude, she said, there is no hope for Master John. That is what it means. What we heard was none of the servants and no human voice. The servants heard the screams too, but they seemed to come from far off. How can you talk such nonsense, Gertrude replied. A person like you ought to know better. Papa says you must find out what it was and let him know. The girl then returned to the hall where she found her father, talking to the old doctor who had just arrived. Mr. Carnson was saying, It was like a woman's voice, screaming as though in the utmost distress. You would have supposed she was being murdered. The doctor replied that he had been crossing the lawn at the time, and that if the noise had come from outside the house, he must have heard it. After Gertrude had reported the failure of her inquiries, her father asked her to tell her mother, who was in John's room, of the doctor's arrival. On her way upstairs, she looked into the west room, where she found that the others had been joined by Ellen, a faithful and attached servant with the youngest child, then about two and a half in her arms. Ellen said they had been in one of the rooms on the first landing when they had heard the shrieks coming, as it were, from the west room or near it. The child asked, Who is screaming, Ellen? I didn't scream, and picking her up the maid had run to the west room to find out what was the matter. One of the children remarked, Poor Johnny, how frightened he must have been, whereupon Ellen suggested, Could it have been Master John? Seized with a fit? Struck with an idea, Gertrude ran upstairs. The door of her brother's room was partly open, and when she went in she saw him lying with a very placid look on his face. As she passed the bed, he gave her a look and a smile, but did not speak. Her mother was resting on the sofa, and her aunt was reading by the window. Nothing in short could have been quieter or more composed in the room and its inmates. After announcing the doctor's arrival, Gertrude went over to the bed to discover, if possible, without alarming her brother, if he had heard the shrieks. Johnny, how quiet you look, she said. Have you been asleep? No, Gertie, he replied. I was not asleep, and I knew the doctor had come. I heard Dash give his little bark, meaning a short single bark which the old dog, who lay on a mat in the hall, always gave when the doctor arrived. So it seemed that John had heard the bark, but not the awful shrieks which had rung through the house and been heard by everyone in it except himself and those who were with him. The doctor was not his way up, and Gertrude, as she left, beckoned to her aunt to follow her. In the West Room she told her of her experience, the aunt replying that everything had been exceptionally quiet that afternoon in John's room. He had been lying awake, but without speaking for some time, and no unusual noise of any kind had been heard. An immediate search was made, every possible cause being sought for and suggested, but all was in vain. No explanation was forthcoming. Next morning the doctor came to breakfast, accompanied by his brother, the old clergyman, who occasionally visited John, and while they were there the housekeeper and the farm bailiff were called in and questioned as to the result of the inquiries which, by Mr. Carnson's orders, they had made. One point was clear. The sound had been made in the house, since no one outside had heard them. The accounts of all those inside the house tallied. There had been three shrieks at short intervals. It was as though a woman's voice were being strained to the utmost, and the noise had ended in a dying rattle. What was most unaccountable was that the shrieks were loudest on the staircase, close to the west room, and therefore should have been distinctly audible in John's room, just above, yet everyone there was utterly unconscious of them. Nothing more could be done. The servants were given strict orders not to allow any report of what had happened to leak out. Mr. Carnson, who disliked the subject so much that no one ventured afterwards to allude to it in his presence, enjoined a similar silence on the children. The clergyman, after hearing all the evidence, pronounced the incident to be a, of a kind for which it was impossible to give a natural explanation. He told us that we could not pretend to deny the reality of what we had heard, but must not give way to superstitious fancies. Some lesson or warning, which time would make more clearly known, was intended. From that day onwards, even those of us 
who had been most hopeful, found their confidence gone, though for another week John's health continued to show signs of improvement. After that he took a turn for the worse, and three weeks from the day when his shrieks were heard he died. It may be asked whether a similar warning was given on the occasion of the death of any other member of the family. Fifteen years later, John's young sister Emma was on her deathbed. In the middle of the night, just before the end, those who were watching in a room heard sounds of hysterical wailing and lamentation passing through the house. The noises ceased as she drew her last breath. A few months later, when the daughters were watching by the deathbed of their mother, they had so strong an expectation of hearing that unearthly voice once more that they told each other they ought to doubt the evidence of their senses if it came, but it did not come. Nor was any warning given of the death of two of the sons in distant lands, or when Mr. Carnson himself passed away in March 1860 as he knelt in prayer by his bedside. The Shrouded Watcher This curious tale was taken from Blackwood's magazine for January 1891. It is many years since the following remarkable incident in my life took place. For the ordinary commonplace details of everyday experience, my memory is generally indifferent. But the circumstances in this case were such that they have indelibly fixed themselves in my recollection, as though they had occurred yesterday. At the time I allude to, I was a very raw young ensign, scarcely done with the goose step. My regiment was quartered in the barracks situated in a suburb of Valletta, the capital of Malta. To make my narrative clearer, I will begin by presenting to the reader the chief character in it. Ralph D. was a young fellow with an odd history. What brought him to Malta, none of us ever exactly knew. He was understood to have been in one of John Company's regiments, but whether horse or foot, I cannot remember. His own account was that he had left the Indian service for some unexplained reason, and having found his way to Vienna, got himself into a regiment of Austrian cavalry, as not a few British ex-officers managed at that time to do. But for reasons best known to himself and the authorities, his stay in the Emperor's service was not of long duration, and when I joined my regiment in Malta, D was a well-known character among the English residents and garrison. Not that the notoriety was altogether conducive to his fair fame, but D had a singular way of worming himself into the good graces of a particular set and passed for a gentleman of affable manners, much wit, and especially a certain bold diablerie that stuck at nothing and gave him a kind of popularity among the more daring spirits in society. How well I can call up his appearance. Dark, brilliant eyes and black hair, a tall lithe figure with a very peculiar but really bewitching smile on occasions when it suited him to please, in a beautifully shaped contour of head and profile. He was known to be of good family, and as he had been in the service, my regiment had made him an honorary member of our mess, and I rather think another corn garrison had given him the same entree into theirs. At all events, he was on pretty good terms with some of our fellows, though our colonel and one or two of the older officers certainly did not encourage him much, as his example was not considered beneficial to the juniors. D was a wonderful billiard player. I never saw anyone to beat him at losing hazards or the spot stroke. As to pool our lives, whereas nothing in his hands, and at all card games in particular, both the skill and the luck of the man were extraordinary. Night after night, I have seen him at play, and his winnings must have almost sufficed to maintain him. As to other traits in his character, I am sorry to say, I never heard of one single good or generous sentiment that could be traced to him. Dee's talk at the mess table or in the anna room was of the most cynical flavor it was ever my lot to hear, and though de mortuis nil nisi bonum is an excellent and decent moral to abide by truth compels me to add that some very sinister tales of Dee's influence over the other sex had got about at the time I speak of. What has now come to be dignified where the name of hypnotism was unknown as such in those days. But I believe D possessed some conspicuous powers in this direction, and I am afraid was not always over-scrupulous in his use of them. Even at this distance of time, his portrait stands out clear in my mind's eye, with a kind of Rembrandt-like sheen upon it, by reason of the mysterious shadow in the background, which was to loom up and cover it with the blackness of night. 
I ought perhaps to add for the better understanding of what is to follow, that for a little while before the denouement came, some ominous whisperings got afloat among about D, and the methods whereby so much silver and gold was perpetually being transferred at whist and at cart from other people's pockets to his own. For in my long experience of those holdings or gracious majesty's commission, notwithstanding a black sheep here and there, it is not to be denied that scrupulous honor and fair dealing have ever been in the forefront of their traditions. I now come to the memorable day of the occurrence of the strange incident, to one phase of which I and others, most of them gone now, were eyewitnesses. The season was Holy Week towards the end of April 18. Music had always been a passion with me, and every afternoon preceding Good Friday in that particular week, when I could get off duty from the dust and glare of the white parade ground and the monotonous bawling of the drill sergeant, it was my wont to steal away to the Duomo of San Giovanni, and who that has ever sat in that stately cathedral church and in the dimly lighted atmosphere, odorous with incense, listen to the entrancing strains of the office of Tenebre, could ever forget it. The eve of Good Friday arrived. I had gone over to see a friend on the Verdala side of the Grand Harbor and was returning after dark. The night was still, calm, and cloudless. The air was deliciously soft. As I sat in the stern of the gondola-shaped galley, while the dark figure of the boatman silently plied his long sweeps, great gray ramparts frowned on every side, and lights twinkled, flashing back in wavering duplicates from the faintly rippling water. I was soon alongside the low jetty on the Valletta side, and ascending the great flight of steep stone steps, presently found myself in the straight Strada Real. Here was no easy matter, threading one's way for the procession of the Stazione, representing the main incidents of the Passion, was passing up the street. At all times this pageant has seemed to me full of solemnity notwithstanding, that the symbolic figures used are often somewhat tawdry. In the intense silence and deep reverence of the spectators, as the will of the music swells louder and louder, and the sacred form upraised on a colossal cross, flanked by the two malefactors on lesser crosses, in the sudden bearing of all heads, as the shrouded platform bearers go by, in all this one feels the cardinal truth borne in upon one despite all the gewgaws and evanescent emotion of the scene. There were reasons why this strange passion procession on this particular Holy Thursday night should have stamped itself deep upon my memory. Even at the time, it seemed to capture me as I passed up the long, narrow street out of hearing of the wild music and reached the great stone gateway of our barrack square. The echo of the sentry's sharp challenge followed by past friend, all's well had hardly died down when I found myself at the door of my quarters, which faced the officer's mess block. By this time the Pasha moon, all but full, was high in the sky and cast a great shadow from the tall buildings facing the range of barracks across the parade ground. Though on this night superfluous, a feeble oil lamp flickered here and there, for gas was a luxury not that indulged in, and the department which was charged with these things loved darkness better than light, because it cost less. I should here explain that Thursdays were the guest nights of my regiment at that time, and on this evening the regimental band had as usual been playing on the open space just outside, fronting the mess room windows. It must have been past eleven o'clock when I reached barracks, and although most of the outsiders who were allowed in to hear the music on such occasions were gone, I noticed two or three still waiting about. One in particular, a remarkably tall man in a long dark cloak, was standing under one of the mess windows with his back to me. I sauntered into my room, lit a cigar, and came out again to muse in the quiet moonlight over the Tenebre and the Stazione. By this time the loiterers were all gone except the tall cloaked man, who appeared to have never moved or changed his position since I saw him first. The open windows of the mess room were still aglow, and through the boughs of a row of lank stunted trees along the enclosure wall, one could see the distant twinkling lights of the town. Something in the appearance of this solitary shrouded figure attracted and fixed my attention. To be so attired on a warm, balmy night like this, in a semi-tropical climate, seemed peculiar, and I had already been struck by his phenomenal stature, 
contrasted with those who had been standing beside him. Who could the man be, and what on earth was he waiting there for? It crossed my mind that this must be either one of the dominoed incogniti who had been following in the Passion Procession, or else one of the capuchins from a neighboring monastery. But a friar would hardly stroll in to listen to a military band, and then stand stock still alone under the windows of the officer's mess. With a passing thought came the sound of pretty loud talking, and occasionally a laugh from the lit-up anteroom opposite, where it was plain some of our fellows were probably engaged at whist, loo, or some other card game. Why, I cannot tell, but along with a feeling of indefinable repulsion towards him, an impulse seized me to watch the muffled stranger closely. At the same time, I had an awakening consciousness that I had better walk straight over and ask the man what he wanted there at that time of night. As my gaze fastened itself on the motionless figure whose head seemed in the bright moonlight to be bent a little to one side, in an intent listening attitude, I became aware of a kind of chill and numbness creeping through my limbs with that horrible sense of inability to move, forward one occasionally experiences in dreams when something dreadful is going to happen which one wants to avert. Yes, whoever the man was, most assuredly he must be watching and waiting, and listening for something or somebody in the mess room, with that strained intentness yet absolute quiescence of posture. But why? This vehement and altogether unaccountable foreboding of impending evil borne in upon me. These thoughts, however, were all the work of a few seconds when, with the eyes still riveted on the mysterious watcher, I heard several voices within the room calling out in excited tones, as though some altercation were going on. One voice above all the others came with a kind of strident harshness through the open window, and which it was easy to recognize these hard and distinct accents. I seemed to hear the words rasping out now as I write. I tell you, I dealt myself the ace of spades. Then another voice, young ends. I take my oath, you didn't. And then a terrible imprecation from D, which I will not repeat, invoking the Prince of Darkness to the ruin of his soul and body. And what he had stated was not the truth. As the last words struck on my ear, the tall cloaked figure made an instantaneous movement, leaped up with a light swift spring to the window sill he was standing under, and disappeared through the muslin curtains into the room. I was unable to see further into it from my position. Another instant, and an ear-piercing scream rang out, a harsh appalling cries of mingled pain, rage, and terror, from one in dire extremity, and to my horror and utter amazement, he in the cloak reappeared at the window with D gripped in his arms and half slung over one shoulder, apparently struggling desperately. One instant, both faces were visible in the moonlight. D's ghastly and convulsed, the other set back in his somber hood and covered with a black domino, from the eyelets of which I was near enough to catch a lightning flash of fiendish malignancy and exultation. Ere I could collect my bewildered senses, sufficiently to rush across to stop them, which I did a moment later. Both men had vanished round an angle of the building. After them I rushed, shouting to the gate sentry to alarm the guard, but on reaching the rear of the block not a soul was in sight. Out turned out the guard, and telling the sergeant to take a file and search the enclosure for two men fighting, I ran round to the mess room. Meanwhile, and before I could reach the entrance door to the mess, the bell inside was ringing up peal after peal, and an officer came, tearing out full tilt, nearly knocking me down. What is it? I burst out. Where's C, our regimental doctor? Is he in his quarters? He demanded, and away he rushed towards the quarter where Dr. C lived. I ran into the anteroom along with one or two of the mess waiters, helter-skelter, and what a sight inside. There huddled in a group with pale, scared faces, a whist table overturned and a litter of cards strewn all over the floor, were some half-dozen of my comrades. Stooping over the prostrate form of D, who lay motionless with lips apart, eyeballs fixed and staring, his head lying back supported by one of our fellows. The surgeon, C, came in, and the minute after tore open D's waistcoat and shirt, looked hard at him, knelt down and put his ear to the drawn mouth, felt about the region of the heart and shook his head. D was dead. As for myself, I could hardly believe my senses. The man I had just seen bodily carried off struggling in the arms of an unknown individual, lying here dead, it seemed an absolute hallucination. 
I was too taken aback to ask a single question, but as my inquiring eyes went round the circle of assembled officers, I could see in the countenances of all a certain constraint mingled with their horror, but not a syllable was said. It was plain there was a further mystery behind. The remains of the ill-fated D were removed to a spare room in the officers' quarters, and there laid out to await official proceedings on the morrow. It was not till after the funeral that I learned what had caused the uproar and altercation in the mess room, which immediately preceded the terrible catastrophe of that memorable night. And even at this distance of time, I tell the circumstances with pain and reluctance. D had dined with the regiment, and after the band had finished playing, he and some half dozen subalterns sat down to play Viget Um. The stakes were high, and it was noticed that D turned up a remarkable number of naturals, and not a long joined ensign had been dealt an ace of spades and stood. At the conclusion of the round, D, who was dealing again, showed a natural, the ace of which proved to be the ace of spades. This, of course, was too much for young N, green as he was. Hence the indignant remonstrance wafted out to my ears in the barrack square, followed by that awful oath whereupon, according to some of the party, a momentary gust of air seemed to shake the further window sash, and simultaneously the card table was stirred. It was, they said, like the tremor of a slight earthquake shock, and straightway D threw his hands up and fell back in his chair, gurgling like one in a fit. The rest I have told, and I will say no more upon it. Needless to say, the officers of Her Majesty were for a long thereafter cherry of conferring upon outsiders, the privilege of honorary membership of their mess. We kept our impressions as far as possible to ourselves, though something about them necessarily leaked out through the guard and sentry I had hailed. And from my original statements concerning the pair, I believed I had been so palpably in the moonlight. When the formal inquiry by the military and civil authorities came on, it was elicited from the non-commissioned officer of the night guard that no person of the description I gave had been seen to enter or leave the barrack precincts. The certified cause of death was slated to be aneurysm, spasm, or something of the heart, what I suppose we loosely call heart disease. The affair was rather hushed up in deference to the feelings of these relatives, one of whom came out to the island shortly afterwards to make inquiries and settle up the affairs of the deceased. It may be suggested that what I witnessed in the square was no more than a phantasm of my own brain. I should probably have inclined to such of you myself, but for one circumstance. In the room above mine, and looking out on the square toward the mess house, was quartered a very dear fellow, rather favorite with us, although hardly robust enough for a soldier's life. It happened on this very Thursday evening that this man, S., who had been ailing of Malta fever, was lying on a couch in his room by the open window, the night being so warm, and listening to the band. He was still there when I came into barracks and was arrested by the sight of the tall, solitary figure opposite. When several days after the event I touched on the subject, S. broke in with a very troubled face and in a serious, urgent voice asked, Did you see the man in the long cloak waiting for him? Then I knew that whatever extra vision had been vouchsafed to me had been shared by him. Apparitions, the Ghostly Passenger Lord Halifax had this story from a Yorkshire friend and neighbor who was told it by Captain Winter four years ago. It was a special favorite, and he used to relate how once driving in a dog cart with a Yorkshire groom, he told it to his companion, whose comment pleased him greatly. There's nothing strange about that, my lord, the groom had said, because the soul always returns to the body once in 24 hours until the funeral. One evening, after a day shooting at home, I was on my way to stay with my friend Marsh at Gaines Park. I had a drive of some 14 miles to make, and at one point had to cross a bridge over a stream. As I approached, I saw a man leaning over the parapet and looking down into the river below. Noticing that he had a bag by his side and thinking he might be tired, I stopped the dog cart which I was driving and offered to give him a lift if he was going in my direction. He climbed into the cart without a word and sat there in silence. I made two attempts to draw him into conversation, but gave up trying when he made no sign of responding. We drove along for some miles together in silence until we came to a village, where I pulled up rather suddenly outside the inn. 
By this time it was quite dark. The inn was lighted up. Some people were standing in front of the house, and the ostler came forward at once to take my horse's head. My companion got down, and without one word of thanks to me walked straight into the inn. Who is that man who just climbed down? I asked the hostler. He replied that he had not seen anyone. Well, the man I drove up with, I said, to which he answered. You drove up alone, sir. Feeling very uncomfortable, I went into the inn and sent for the landlord. When I told him of my companion and described him, he looked grave and asked me to follow him upstairs. He took me into a room, and there on a bed lay the man to whom I had given the lift. He was dead, and had been dead for some time. In fact, an inquest had just been held on his body. A day or two earlier, he had been found drowned in the stream close to the bridge where I had seen him.